Welcome everyone who in person and virtually who's joining us today for our wonderful program with Jennifer Pick Two. I'd like to welcome you to the Wilson Museum. I'm Julia Gray, our executive director, um, and welcome you to this place, which is, is the homeland of the Penobscot Nation and their Wabanaki relations uh, back thousands of generations. Uh, and wherever you're coming from, whoever's land you are residing on. Uh, I'm excited to welcome Jennifer, who I've worked with in a variety of capacities over the years. Jennifer is a Micmac storyteller, artist, educator, consultant, um, who has uh, been part of the team and leadership at a variety of organizations across New England, um, in, including the Mashantucket Pequot Museum, the Bangor Historical Society, Bangor Center for History. Um, Jennifer and I worked together at the Abbey Museum. Um, and uh, have continued to, to be part of, of working uh, our projects together. Um, and we're, she, is, she is our local expert on uh, Micmac full work and it's, a, and it's been a really neat thing to see the revitalization work that's happening in Micmac communities, especially in Maine um, around um, porcupine quill work. They have, a, they have, Micmac artisans are known for their quill work. Um, it was purchased by kings and queens and the like. Um, and it's wonderful to see it, to see the study of it growing and to see the revitalization of it happening. So I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. Thanks. Hey, there I am. I have to make sure I'm actually in the screen. So hello, everyone here and hello, everybody on the Zoom. Uh, my name is Jennifer Pictou. I am Micmac from the Micmac Nation in Presque Isle. I also belong to the Acadian Band of Micmacs in Nova Scotia. So what does that all mean? That means that I am here to talk to you about Micmac porcupine quill work today. Um, I love how Julia introduced me because honestly, I sound so much more interesting when somebody else talks about me. Uh, when, when I think about Micmac porcupine quill work, I think of the amount of work, just the sheer force of effort that goes into it. And I also get a little bedazzled, a little starstruck when I go into museum collections and I look at what our ancestors have done, because I am always thinking, I could never produce something so perfect, so beautiful, so wonderful. Of course not, I'm still learning. And that's part of the explanation today is what happened to porcupine quill work and where is it going today? So if you have any questions whatsoever, um, there will be an, a question and answer period after uh, this is over. I do have a fairly brief um, presentation for you today. I do have to apologize up front. I did have a really, really good one and I lost it. <laughs> So this one is the backup that uh, didn't get as much love and attention. So yay for backups. So Micmac porcupine quill work. Um, for those of you in the room, how many of you have seen that kind of item before? Everybody, almost everybody has. Okay, that is wonderful. It's very distinctive, isn't it? One of the things that I like to tell people, and they often don't believe me when I tell them, we recognize our ancestors the minute we walk in the room. What I mean by that is when we as Wabanaki artisans, when we as Micmac artisans create something, we leave a part of ourselves in it. And that is a connection to us. That is a connection to our spirit. It is very important that when we walk into a collection area, we are able to look at these items and likewise acknowledge the spirit that has been left behind the portion of that in these items. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I wanted to get that right out front and center because that can be a touchy subject about what we leave behind and what sticks with an item and whose belief concerns what aspect of that. So everything's on the table today. I will answer whatever I can. Now, you said I had no clicker, right? Okay, so here we go. Okay, there we go. History timeline. All right, so um, if there are any typos in this, like I said, this was my backup, so please forgive me. But one of the things that you might be interested to know that in the late 1500s, so I put this at about 1590. I don't have an exact date. But in the late 1500s, what we have is we have Europeans coming over to uh, the, what would be known, come known as the Canadian Maritimes and also Maine. And what was happening is 
most often it was the, the Jesuits who were coming. Then a lot more people started coming and these were traders. And this is when we were kind of, oh, I should say first interacting. And those interactions were going pretty well, actually. I do have to say that. Um, but this is when notice was taken and it was written down that, hey, these Micmacs that show up to these, you know, these delegations, they are dressed in white moose hide outfits. They are bedecked in porcupine quill work. They have headbands that are decorated with porcupine quill work. Porcupine quills are embroidered and put into hair pieces. Young women are wearing porcupine quills. Some young men are wearing porcupine quills. The adults are wearing girdles that are embroidered with porcupine quills. Mm. So there is a lot that's going on. Much more than that was also created. And it was written down by the French. The French kept excellent records. And we often go back to those records in order to discover what we can't open our closet door and see for ourselves kind of thing. So once we get up to 1750, we have uh, about 150 years actually of great influence by the French traders. And the French traders are setting up trade houses and they are getting uh, indigenous people working into a system of debit and credit instead of trade. So what happens is there is more demand for things like furs. There's more demand for things like porcupine quill work. So what happens is a lot of the quill work was left behind. The quill work that takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort. If you cannot produce something quickly, you're not going to make any money. And money is what the trade houses wanted. They didn't necessarily want what you had as goods so much as they were working into more of a monetary, a cash society. Trading still did happen. But as we know, that also petered out when the animals started to peter out as well. So once we get into 1750, there is a fantastic delegation of French who come and they write down in their journals, the Micmac look absolutely haggard. When once they used to come to us and they were dressed in white moose hide and adorned with porcupine quill work, now they come to us in gray homespun and they look like beggars. That's because of the changing socioeconomics that was going on between the European tradesmen and the indigenous people. And we were working hard to catch up. Instead of adorning ourselves, we were now making things to be purchased for trade, items that would be sold back into the European market. Things like dishes, baskets, boxes. Boxes became very popular. And that's a lot of what I have pictures of today, but we'll discuss why a little bit later. About the 1861, and that's when uh, the Victorian era really kind of took off. King Edward died, Victoria came to rule, and this is when we have this wonderful rising class, the middle class. The middle class is becoming more affluent. So what do they do? They wanna do what the wealthy do. They wanna go on vacation. Who doesn't like going on vacation? Well, they like to as well. And one of the things that happened during the Victorian era was that they wanted to collect souvenirs of where they had been. And indigenous people stepped up to that. And they said, great, we can make souvenirs. This is how a lot of our Micmac quilled boxes, chairs, placemats, and other items end up in museum collections because they were purchased in the trade, they were taken back for a home collection, and then when eventually people passed on and others didn't know what to do with it, they took it to their local museum and they donated it. And there are some very interesting pieces out there in the world. Yes, the Vatican does have some interesting pieces to their collection. Yes, kings and queens have purchased items or had them purchased and sent back to them. Um, not all items were purchased, some were stolen. It's very difficult to walk into a museum and say that was stolen or that was purchased. 
And the running assumption is that many of these things were made for the trade system itself. By 1879, we have the boarding and residential school system. The boarding and residential school system is actually where we have the big break. There is a lot of stress on indigenous communities, particularly Mi'kmaq communities, because through war and disease, 90% of our people died. And it's kind of humbling to wake up in the morning sometimes and think, huh, I am here because 10% of my people survived. That's hard. But then when I go into collections and I see the work that has been left behind, I don't feel quite so alone. When the boarding and residential school system, when that era really began, what we see is we see a break and the young children who were taken away from families, sent to boarding and residential schools. And, and pretty much I see by the nods in the room that pretty much everybody knows what happened there. But what also happened is there was a loss of traditional arts. When we sit down as a community, one of the things that we love the most is that we get to laugh. We get to work and laugh and tell stories and language. Micmac language is spoken a lot. And we discuss openly, hey, what's the word for this? What's the word for that? And that's how we learn. That particular community aspect was completely broken with the residential school um, era. Children came back, they did not know how to speak their language. Uh, they did not know how to harvest porcupine quills, much less utilize them in decorative um, art forms. So to sit down and watch your elders do this was a complete mystery to them because it was completely opposite of what they were being taught in these schools. By 2012, in the Presque Isle Micmac community, we had a community survey. Oh, those boring surveys. You have to answer so many questions about what do you know and how do you know it? And how many people in your family can do this or that? Well, I'll tell you, it was invaluable because we found out that one household in our community could actually do porcupine quill work embroidery. At that time, I was the tribal historic preservation officer. So taking that information, I applied for a tribal heritage grant. We were awarded the grant. And what we did is we started a revitalization project to bring this back. And in 2020, we were going strong. We were meeting, there was a core group of women and then the pandemic happened. Wah, wah. The pandemic really messed everything up for us. We still are a group. We have not have been able to meet again, but we are planning to. And some of the artwork that our group has developed is also going to be on display in our own tribal exhibit space as well. So this is a good thing. Everything is that I'm leading up to is for good things. In 2023, Ongoing, we have eight new, and I am one of those eight new Micmac porcupine quill workers. There are established quill workers in the world, people like Tara Francis, Ingrid Brooks, Melissa Peter Paul, and they are all in Canada. So it's important to remember that when I speak to you today, I'm talking about just this side, the US side of the border because there are 35,000 Micmacs in Canada, but in my community, my home community, there are only about 1,500 of us. So knowing that, and I've talked your ear off already, let's look at the trade items. Trade item like this one right here. This is a Micmac quilled chair seat and back. Oh, I mean, just the, the back and the bottom of tall backed chairs would be quilled. This is amazing. This is actually, um, I was stunned to find this as an online auction item. Yeah, I didn't have the thousands of dollars they wanted for it. Otherwise it would have been mine. Uh, this particular design here, this is our eight pointed star, Gokwit. And Gokwit is, goes back to a very, very ancient story for us of a Mi'kmaq who is walking on the beach and he sees, he looks up to the heavens and he sees the stars twinkling. And then he sees a star fall into the ocean. He wants to follow the star, 
So as he's walking along the beach, he's following the trail that the light is making in the water until finally when he's walking along the rocky coast, he sees this glowing starfish come up to the shore and then crawl out upon land. And it was the fallen star. And so the starfish and the eight pointed star are very, very closely linked together. Sometimes you'll see people say, oh, this was, uh, this represented seven districts and, and, and Great Britain. That's a really kind of a big flag. I mean, and that's a, because it's a more uh, modern interpretation of this, because there is a point in our history where there is knowledge of Great Britain and the crown. Before that, there was not. So you can pretty much tell where an interpretation of a symbol lies um, just by what is being told. Now, were these colors as vibrant as they are in this photo? Absolutely, yes. Natural dyes were used and when we could actually get our hands on them when they were available, commercial dyes were used to dye porcupine quills. These all started off as white, just like this here. And Julia was kind enough to um, gift me with some porcupine quills. Now the porcupine quills, if anybody here has ever been stuck with one, has anybody? Oh, says, oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, they hurt, don't they? Okay, you don't wanna know why? Because at the end of each of these porcupine quills, like this one right here, like right there, the black tip of that quill actually has seven to 800 barbs on it and they're all facing the back way. So once it sticks in, it's extremely difficult to pull out because there are seven to 800 little grippers on it. So this is a very, very dangerous little thing. Do porcupine quills get thrown by porcupines like you see in cartoons? No, 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 no. But they do make great artwork. Now, when we go into, whoops, I went backwards on that. Sorry about that. When I talk about the Victorian quilled chair, this is what I'm talking about. This amazing quilled chair that is in the Abbey Museum permanent collection right now. This is a jaw dropper. And believe it or not, the seat shows where someone was sitting on this. Somebody was actually using this to sit upon with yards and yards and yards of fabric with the weight of their body on these fragile quills. The chair back, because the Victorians had such better posture than I do, uh, they actually had very straight backs and they wouldn't tend to lean up against the back of the chair. So the chair back is an exquisite condition. The other side of it, however, is not so great, but it was wonderful because we could see the inside of the back of the chair. And then we said, oh, that's how they did it. Museum collections can often answer questions for us today about how our ancestors actually performed a task. So these items in these collections are incredibly important to us. Now, dining chairs like this, no, this was not just one, because if you were a wealthy Victorian woman, just like the ladies in the back, you would want eight of them or more. You would order a set of them and you would also order the matching placemats. Now imagine a table with eight of these chairs sitting around it and eight placemats. It would make a stunning central piece to your home. And it would also be a wonderful conversation starter to your adventures where you actually met real Native Americans. And a lot of the Victorians did that. These were the whole idea of the souvenir. Common misconceptions, I love this. One of the things that we did um, at the Abbey Museum, the exhibit just ended. The exhibit for Micmac Quill Work just ended. And one of the things that we did is we tackled misconceptions and we did it from a decolonized perspective. We asked quill workers, quill artists, what is your opinion about this? And that's the opinion we used. We knew the exhibit was a success when there was an email sent to the director at the time of the Abbey Museum 
And it said, this exhibit would be wonderful if you'd let me rewrite it. It really rankled because it was from the first perspective of an indigenous artist because it was not written in the format of exhibits, proper exhibits. And anybody here can tell you there are lots of books on that. Exhibit text, how to write exhibit text correctly, how to catalog things correctly. And we were speaking from our own perspective as well as voicing for our ancestors. So common misconceptions. Some of the things that we really wanted to hit with this kind of work was um, really three three things. Reclaiming our narratives was a big portion of this. And we wanted to face some of the academic stereotypes like, well, Micmacs only did geometric designs. Oh, no, no, we didn't. No, we did not. We were quite well versed in a variety of forms. Um, we also said, you know, our work is culturally significant because a lot of academics have said their work is not significant because other people did it too. But we were known far and wide as the people who used porcupine quills. The Maliseed have a name for us and it's the porcupine hunters because we use the porcupine quills so much. And these types of narratives were really important to break down. And the other one was uh, that academics tend to say there is no purpose to their geometric designs. They have no meaning. Let's talk about some of those no meanings, shall we? Overlooked elements. Would somebody like to tell me on this slide where all those geometrics are? Obviously, there are no curved lines, are there? Anywhere. Curvilinear lines on items like this, and this is at the De Bruce Museum, 1868 quilled cradle. You can see from the inside that it is bark. It is made out of bark. Uh, birch bark embroidery is the most common type of Micmac quill work you will see. Uh, combined with other types of wood, they make very sturdy items. And this cradle is absolutely fascinating because we have the curved lines. There's a moose that has been embroidered using quills. And this kind of blows all of that away. When the academics like to tell us, oh, you just do geometrics. You just do triangles, squares, rounds. That's it, that's all you do. We had a good time with that one. Mm -hmm. Knowing how to read the visual language of our ancestors is to know the world. That's from me. That's actually from the exhibit because I love to read art. And one of the things that happened, and I will have to go back to the chair. I'm sorry, I don't have a better picture of it. When we went back to this chair, this is actually sitting in this picture in our tribal council chambers. When we partnered with the Abbey Museum, we said, hey, how would you like to bring some of our stuff up to us? Because we're never gonna get our tribal members down to Bar Harbor. It's um, too time consuming. It's not cost effective for folks. Um, people just can't take two days off of work, three days off of work and just go hit Bar Harbor. So the Abbey Museum did something that is uh, pretty unknown. And that was, they said, okay, and packed up the entire Micmac quill collection and drove it up to Presque Isle four and a half hours away. Trusting us to work with them, we put these in tribal council chambers because they came to our homeland. Remember what I said earlier, when an artist makes something, you leave a part of yourself there. Recognizing our ancestors were coming home we're on Micmac land for the first time in sometimes 200 years. We had a welcome ceremony for them. We left the door wide open. And anytime I speak about this, I tell you about Frank the Cat. Frank the Cat. If anybody works in museums here and online, you will probably gasp to know that there was a cat in a room with 
very fragile objects from a museum collection. Fra Fra Frank walked in the door. The door was left wide open. We wanted, because the building is built in such a way that if the door is closed, it looks like the building is just closed down. We had to leave the door open to welcome in our tribal members. And we also left the door open so that uh, folks from the non-native community would feel welcome in coming in as well. We had advertised this throughout Presque Isle, throughout Aroostook County. That day we got a mix of tribal members and non-tribal members and we had Frank. Frank is a res cat. Frank walked in our door, looked around, and he felt very comfortable being there. And we all said, well, the ancestors sent Frank. And we said, but Frank really shouldn't be here. So the cultural director shooed Frank out the door. Frank came back. He was shooed out the door. Frank came back again. It was at that point we had to shut the door. Otherwise, Frank would have stayed there all day. Seeing an animal come into our space with our ancestors, with the important work that we were doing was actually seen as a good sign for us. It was a sign that we were headed in the right direction. So we, as though we welcomed Frank, you know, we also had to adhere to some museum professional standards and, and send Frank on his way. So Frank the cat helped us. In fact, he came in right through those doors behind that chair. Now, this particular chair, when we took a look at it, you'll see on the, on the back of it, the back of it actually has uh, what looks like just geometric designs. But if you know what you're looking for, you can read it. And that's what we started to take apart in our class that day. We looked at where the placement of the circles, the dots, the half circles, if you look, very closely at the middle band where it, that big center diamond is, that uneven upward movement to the peak in the center and then it comes down on the other side, those are the mountain ranges. The red, the orange color, the yellow that is there is actually the sunrise. This was a statement about community. Now think about how difficult that is. When this chair was made, which would be the mid 1800s, we have a residential school system that is going into place. We have uh, reservations that are in effect. We have growing Indian, federal Indian policy that is stripping us of our ability to um, worship as we will, to be able to use um, eagle feathers. We are being stripped of everything. These types of trade commodities were a way of sustaining cultural values, cultural ideas, our ideology. And this was a form of cultural resistance while we were making money. Have I confused anybody yet? Excellent. This particular, um, this is a tea cozy, by the way. I missed my, it's like I said, this is the backup uh, version. So I missed my, my connection to where, what museum this is in, but this is actually a tea cozy. And the tea cozy, you will notice, has that eight pointed star in the center. You'll see that on the bottom, it has uh, a couple of half rounds with half stars. That is the rising sun. Using the same type of motif in different ways can mean different things. Chevrons often mean trees. There are clouds, lightning bolts, birds, wigwams, crosses built into our artwork. I know you all came for this. So how long does it take to make one of these things, right? Yeah, um, if you ask an artist that, they're actually going to tell you that it takes a lifetime, about a hundred years. Why does it take a hundred years? Because of the life of the birch tree, it can live to about 40 to 50 years, but you can only harvest the bark from a tree once. You can never go back and reharvest. When we take the bark from a tree, we do it in a manner that does not kill the tree. The tree still survives. 
Now, we also know that there are specific times of year that you can harvest birch bark. When the sap is running underneath the bark, sounds all very mystical, doesn't it? You have to know your trees, you have to know your seasons, and there are also other natural environment indicators that tell our birch bark artisans when they can go and harvest. They are tightly held secrets and not everything is told. And that's one of the things that can be very frustrating for someone wanting to learn about this type of artwork is that we don't always tell our secrets. One of the things that we do is we keep a really good handle on what we know and what we can do to preserve the resource. Because we are at a point in much of our climate change where our resources are dying off. And it is our job, our duty as stewards of the earth to keep these things alive. Now, making one of these things starts with the life cycle, the death cycle, the harvest cycle, all of this, from the tree to the porcupine to the artist themselves, because we have a learning process, a learning process that is first, I watch you do it, then I do it with you, then I do it, and then I teach somebody else to do it, and that is our learning process. But did anybody ask the porcupine? What about that? A poor little dude, he's just kind of walking around, right? Porcupines can actually live, the North American porcupine can live for about 18 years. And I have a story about a porcupine. I was driving home very late uh, last summer, came up a hill over by in Freedom, Maine, little tiny little town, and right next to the cemetery. I love cemeteries, that's another story. But up the hill and I came to a screeching halt because there was a very large porcupine in the middle of the road and it is almost midnight and I stop and I see that it's a mama porcupine and she has a porcupet and he is very tiny he very tiny little thing he could have fit in my hand and mama was trying to get him across the great black river that was the paved road and it was terrifying so I stopped my vehicle, I hopped out, I went to assess the situation, never mind traffic, right? But I went back to my vehicle, I got a plastic cup, reduce, reuse, recycle. And I used that plastic cup to tap that little porcupet on the butt to get him across the road as he squeaked indignantly at me. What did mom do? She took off into the cemetery. At that point in time, she figured, ah, oh, something's gonna eat my baby but I will live to have more babies. They eventually did get back together because once the little porcupet hit the grass, he took off running. Now, how could I have harvested porcupine quills at that point in time? We do not kill the porcupine to harvest their quills. That is a misconception. Two of the ways that we get them is we get roadkill. Why waste a good carcass? And the other thing is that we may keep a very heavy blanket or very heavy thick towel in the back of our vehicle. And when we see a living porcupine, we can throw the very heavy fabric down over the animal. And as it walks away, it will release a lot of quills into that blanket. Will it leave it defenseless? Absolutely not, because a porcupine has, from where the quills start all the way down to its tail, it has about 30,000 quills on its body. They will replenish. So getting quills is kind of a sticky affair, if you ask me. I know bad jokes are free, okay? That's the totally bad jokes are free. When we harvest bark and quills, we have to do it in a sustainable manner. Everybody's seen a porcupine. Yes, they do hang out in trees. They just love, love, love fruits and vegetables. When we harvest the bark though, take a look at that photo. The, bar the bark that you're looking at here, um, this is considered a perfect peel. A perfect peel is when it comes off in one big sheet. This was my peel. But uh, honestly, I could have done more. It should be much bigger, much, much bigger. It should be about six feet if I can do it. 
And what I had to do is um, get my hand in between certain layers of the birch bark and just kind of work it around. And you have to be patient and you have to be very diligent about not, not cutting into the tree so it will die or get an infection and die. And to be able to take the amount of birch bark that you need. Processing birch bark, that's a whole other thing because sometimes you're on the move and my ancestors would actually roll birch bark up just like paper, roll it up, three big sheets of birch bark and we would use birch bark to cover our wigwams. So you have these big rolls of birch bark that you need to unroll. Well, it's dried out, it's going to break. So you'd take your rolls of birch bark to the river and you'd submerge them hydrate them again, and then you could unroll them. That's what you're seeing here in these photos. The first one, you're seeing uh, birch bark that has been dried out, rehydrated. Cool water, not a big deal, right? But then come the sharp implements, and that's the second photo. That's when we've actually taken a square, and this was from our class through that grant project, and we were learning how to separate the layers of birch bark because we don't want to poke through all the layers. There's only a certain piece that we want to take. And the third photo is us gently prying those layers of birch bark apart. It's really high tech stuff there, pliers and newspaper. And here we have processing porcupine quills. Now porcupine quills are hollow. They do need to be soaked though. And what you're seeing in these photos is we have some colored porcupine quills, and these are commercial. We purchased those through the grant funds um, because we just didn't have the time to go out and throw a lot of blankets and collect roadkill and do all that, and then go through the dyeing process. We did have a portion of a day where we took white quills and we dyed them with commercial dyes just to get that practice down. So we were working with all kinds of colors. In the cup, in the second photo, you see just plain white quills that are in very, very hot water because the hot water will make them more pliable. So what do we do with those pliable porcupine quills? Well, you have to design. Your design is the most important thing. So you spend a lot of time figuring out what's going to fit on the piece of birch bark or what is the end result that I want to do. Had we made birch bark boxes, we would have also had to have gone out and harvested spruce root. We did not do that. What we did is we made um, barrettes, we made pins, we made pendants, we made the things, the small things that you could just take in your hand and go. Now, some of those of you who have asked about that pointy end of the quill, what we did is we actually pre-punched a hole into the birch bark, and then we inserted the quills into our design, and we learned different types of stitches. Flip that birch bark over, and you've got this wicked looking thing. And all of these pointy bits are all sticking up. So we had to do something with those. So then we had to cut them and process them so they would not stick out. Because what we wanted was we wanted a flat piece of work. And getting a flat piece of birch bark quill work with three dimensional tubes is kind of a touchy thing. Inspiration for today. What do we do with this? Many of our artisans now, we are actually making porcupine quill items. When you look at things like, let's go back here to um, a, something like a tea cozy, how much would that be? Anybody have a guess? I would charge about a thousand for it. Easy, easy, because it is a big size. It is a tremendous amount of work. And now that we've gone over the process, the basics of the process, you can understand how many roadside carcasses I'm going to be handling. And every carcass has hairs, just like the ones on your head. Some of your hairs are thicker, some are thinner, some are longer. And there are certain size quills that you want for certain types of stitches. 
and also for certain size projects. So then you have to further separate out the quills and the separating of the quills is probably the longest part of the process. And it is monotonous. Uh, there's no sexy way of dressing that up. It's a lot of work and you're going to spend a long time doing it. But how can these things that sit in our collections today, how can we utilize them? Uh, the wonderful introduction by Julia. I am an artist, I'm a glass artist. I do stained glass uh, work of my own. I do stained glass restoration. Um, I'm doing uh, lamp working uh, on the torch. I can make baskets, but I'm not a basket maker. There is a distinction. I am a quill worker, but I am a fledgling quill worker. This is something I'm learning and that I'm helping to pass on and helping to teach. But what can we do with these things? And I'd like to end this today with taking a look at a couple of things that you might not really have connected. The picture on your left, this is the original photo of a porcupine quilled box in the Abbey Museum collection. I really worked on the color to bring the color up. These things are highly faded. To get the color that I would like to see, just to get a glimpse of what it might be. And then I take the porcupine quill work box tops and I transfer these over into a stained glass design. Not everybody wants or needs or can afford a thousand dollar tea cozy, but things like glass, these are readily available to a lot of people. So this is what I do with my artwork. Inspiration today continues. The piece on the left is a quilled box top from the Harvard Peabody Museum. And their Micmac quill collection is rather astounding. Taking that design, I transferred that over into another stained glass piece. And finally, even though it didn't win any awards, I love it so. This is my three-dimensional stained glass replica of a quilled box purse from the 1800s. So I hope that I covered a lot of different bits for you today. A little bit of history, a little bit about museums, a little bit about what we see in our museums, how we handle um, looking and finding, recognizing our own ancestors. The fact that we invited ancestors back home to our community, that we had a welcome ceremony for them that we felt it was reciprocated for us. We also work with museums when possible to um, help develop collection policies in regards to these items. We believe these quilled items are indeed alive because they hold that little piece of the artist's spirit. In doing so, we encourage museum collection people to go into the collection and talk to the items. How would you like being in a room for 200 years and nobody said boo to you? That's how we feel our ancestors should be treated. They should be spoken to. They should be welcomed. Good night, a simple hello and good night is sometimes sufficient. And when possible, we do encourage museums to work on more inclusive manners um, and we know with the Abbey Museum that we have been in conversations, serious conversations about bringing in a drummer to drum and sing around our collections, that the ancestors are connected that way. And we also um, are in conversation about inviting the ancestors to a feast to bring our items out when there is a feast, a luncheon or something of the like, so they can just be included in that community type of effort. Our ancestors are not dead to us. They're sitting in collections and they're waiting for somebody to speak to them. Now I'd like to open up for any questions that you have. We covered a lot in a short amount of time and I felt it went very fast. Maybe you felt differently, but uh, does anybody have any thoughts, any questions? That is a brilliant question. 
And I really have to thank you for asking that question because that's um, not often asked, but it's often wondered about. And I do have an answer for you, believe it or not. Um, speak in what language you are comfortable with. How, uh, why do I say that? Because my father was in residential school. He literally had his language beaten out of him. He never spoke it again. As an adult, I am learning my language. And I had the same question you had. How do I talk to my ancestors? How do I talk to spirits? How do I, how do I do that? How do I say my own prayers if I don't have my own language? And what my elders taught me was speak in the language that you are comfortable with because there is no language barrier because it's coming from your heart and the language of our hearts in what we say and what we do is a universal language and i was always told they will understand when possible i do speak micmac around the items um, that was one of the things that we learned in our or realized i guess had an epiphany about in our community uh, classes, when we started talking about the language, one of us, and I don't remember who, said, can you believe this is the first time in 200 years, those two boxes, because we found two sister boxes made by the same person in the same era, they had been mislabeled. Um, these two boxes have not heard Micmac, most likely in 200 years. So it was very refreshing. Um, a lot of us can't speak it um, on this side of the border. A lot of the families who did end up having folks go to residential school left that area. So that would not be a concern again. And um, a lot of our families moved over here to the US side, um, particularly from the Nova Scotia area. So even though we can't speak our language, we do, we do the best we can and, and trust that our ancestors know. Great question. Really, really great question. Excellent question. And thank you for asking that. Um, I am going to be back to the Wilson Museum in July, and I will be doing a demonstration. So if you want to come back and actually see this done, I will be doing that. For right now, when you look at a quill, and for the folks um, in, at home, there is a dark end and there is a lighter end. If you can see on the lighter end, there is a very tiny tab. It's, it's like it goes, that's the hair follicle piece. It's, that's the part that sticks into the skin. This part, the dark part, of course, is the one that's part pointing outward. You keep both ends as you're working. And what you do with birch bark insertion technique is you'll take an awl or other pointy object, not, you have to be really careful about the size of the quill you're using and the size of the hole you're making. But the first end to go in is the dangerous end. <laughs> Always put the dangerous end in first. And then what you'll do is you will take this other hard little tab and you will insert it into the other hole that you make. So you have to plan out your stitches. You have to plan out what type of stitch you're doing, the length of your stitch, and then you have to choose quills that are the appropriate diameter as well as length for the design that you're making. Not at all. Sometimes it helps if you're in a tight corner, but usually just finger work is just fine. You can bend them with your fingers. Um, you can wrap them down. That's usually pretty easy to do. It's the hot water that makes them pliable enough for you to do that. If you tried to pick this up with um, like dry hands, it's kind of, you know, dry. It's still a little bit on the wintry side of things. You might slip and slide all over this um, particular porcupine quill shaft. If it's uh, very wet, if it's got a little bit of grip to it, you can handle it a lot easier. Excellent question. As you develop it, so what happens is you do it, you, you push a hole into the birch bark, 
and then you push another hole into the birch bark because you know what quill you're going to use. Pointy end goes in, dangerous end goes in first, back end then goes into the second hole. And then from the back, you can pull those tighter. As it dries out, it becomes brittle and they can break very easily. While they're uh, still damp, they're very, very pliable. So you want to work with them damp as quickly as possible. Therefore, you'd think that punching a lot of holes into your birch bark might be more advantageous. It actually isn't because each one of these is different than the last one. They're not uniform in size. We try to pick the most uniform quills that we can, but it's nature. So you may, you're the next quill you pick up maybe a little skinnier or maybe a little fatter. So you might wanna move those holes just a bit. So punching your holes as you go will also help give you the freedom to change the design or the stitch if needed. You're welcome. Oh yes, absolutely. Pencil and eraser are our best friend. Yeah, yeah. Uh, birch bark is actually pretty forgiving when it comes to um, just a pencil and a light eraser. Light, like get the white erasers if you can, because they're not they're not quite so abrasive as the pink erasers. Uh, sketch very lightly your design out on your birch bark, and then what the really great birch bark artists do, the ones in the folks in Canada, they will post photos online, um, Instagram, their Facebook pages of their pieces in the progress. And what they do is they outline everything, just like you were in kindergarten and you were taking crayons and outlining all the parts of your coloring sheet they make the outline of their design in quills, then they go back in and fill in those segments because that also helps keep your lines perfectly even. So outlining first is a critical component to design work. Yes, they have, when we go into collections and we look at porcupine quill work, um, when you handle them as like an artist, I would go in and I would handle, I am going to expect to find debris left behind, even when I touch them. And I've had uh, collections handling training. I wash my hands. I do everything that I am supposed to do. I, I am very, very proper about my museum collection handling techniques. And even then, just because the simple act of moving it from one area to another, the release of pressure on some points, and then putting it back down is a stressor for very dry quills. So there's always going to be a little tiny bit of damage done just from moving it. That's a really good point to bring up, Julian. Thank you for doing that. Because if you happen to have quill work at home, um, you need to look at it for any type of bug damage. Um, those little black beetles with the kind of grayish band in their on their middle. Um, yeah, they love hair, anything organic. This is hair. This this quill is actually a hair. It's just a more dangerous hair than most of us have. So those beetles will eat your collection. Uh, you have to look at them uh, pretty regularly to make sure that no damage is happening. The other thing that will kill a collection is sunlight. Sunlight will damage the color. Remember, we didn't always have access to the natural world. We were being put on reservations. So we didn't have a whole lot of natural resources sometimes that we could get. Sometimes we, we just liked the commercial colors better. I mean, it's hard to get neon green, you know, when you're, when you're walking on the riverside, it's, it's hard to do that. But when we made these beautiful bright colors, and this goes for baskets as well, when you lift up the lid of a basket, you see the brilliant colors on the inside. That's because any light whatsoever will damage the outside of the basket and damage the color. Same goes for the quills. The color will fade really fast. 
If you go get your hair colored at the salon, you have to go back in every four weeks because of the growth, because of the fading. Now think about hair that's sitting on a mantle on a shelf for 75 years or more. That is going to fade as well. It's really interesting though, when things fall apart, sometimes, sometimes you can actually get a peek at what the colors actually were from the side of the, of the quill that did not see daylight. Sometimes you can. Like an old master painting under a painting kind of thing. Yep. Yes. It, it makes me grind my teeth every time I go up and I see somebody's butt print on, on the seat, but, but they were used items. They were meant to be used. They were just very fanciful. Um, so yeah, it, it is remarkable that it stayed. You won't find a complete set of six or eight or 12 or four, whatever, whatever the set was. You won't find a complete set. You'll find one here or there. If anybody happens to travel to Nova Scotia, um, the Nova Scotia Museum in Halifax has a tremendous, it has the largest Micmac quill work collection in the world. And they do have a, a wonderful chair there. Although I would have to say that it might be like, right below the Abbey chair. The Abbey's chair, dining chair, is, is just an exquisite piece. I have not seen anything like it anywhere else. Oh yes, absolutely. I wish I had a better one. Um, the chair, for instance, uh, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry I don't have a, a really good photo of it, but the chair, for instance, had a stepped kind of a, a point in the middle. And once you can stand back at a viewing distance, you can look at that and see, oh, wow, that's the mountain range. The red coming up on the edge of the mountain, that's actually the rising sun. How do we say that or why do we say that? Because we pray to the sun. That is one of our traditional aspects is that when the sun comes up, we do a sunrise ceremony. The sun was what made life. I mean, it fed the plants, you know, without the sun, we would be eaten by animals in the dark. And so having the sun come up was a really big deal. Having the sun represented like that is a central part of our community. Farther down on that particular chair, there were half domes, but in the half domes, there was a little rectangle. That was a wigwam, that was, or, or a longhouse. That was, there were two different shapes. There was the rounded one, and then there was the conical shape. Conical shaped wigwams were our major mode of home life. They were portable. We could wrap the roll up the birch bark and take them with us. Winter wigwams were um, packed around the bottom with a lot of moss to help keep the snow out from the bottom. Uh, and also animal hides were used as well to help insulate. So all of those things, those wigwams, the curved dome buildings, those were um, represented. There were birds represented as um, upside down chevrons. Pine trees are usually denoted as chevrons going this way, just with the point up. Uh, clouds, clouds could be just a group of different dashes. And how you make the different dashes is just a different color quill. And there is also lightning. Uh, they're uh, representing the thunder beings. So when you get a really close look at these types of um, items in the quill work, you can actually read the whole scene like it's a painting. I'm sorry, that was it. That was in the really good PowerPoint that I lost. <laughs> Go ahead.
you might say, hey, whatever happened to that grant, you know, with COVID, we, we came up with a, a group. We do have a group. We are called the Quillers of the Dawn. Um, one of the ladies in the group, her daughter, who also is a quiller, she is also a graphics artist. And she was the one who came up with that. And we debated for four hours over different logos. And we just love what sold it for us were the porcupine feet because we thought they were adorable and we wanted the porcupine feet as part of our logo. It's a lot of voices when you go into a collection and a lot of, a lot of native artisans when they go to the National Museum of the American Indian, they will walk in and because there are so many ancestors there that they can really feel it. It makes some of our artisans sick. They have to step out. And because of that, NMAI has actually designated a room for smudging for a place to, to go in order to um, come down from that kind of onslaught of, of that energy of, of many particular voices. But it's the same with one as it is for a room full of them depending upon who was involved. Usually when we were looking for someone to um, teach us how to harvest birch bark in our class, um, it turned out to be a man. You know, so-and-so's cousin, he does it. So-and-so's husband, he did it. Oh, my uncle, he used to do that. So it very quickly became um, noticeable to us that there was a division of labor in this that men were usually the ones out gathering the birch bark, not that women didn't, but it was usually men who were doing it and the women were processing the quills because that was so time intensive. The division of labor was actually necessary in order to produce during the trade era uh, enough of the pieces in order to make a living. And we find that that still kind of flows today. And you'll find some people who say, oh, porcupine quill work. Oh, that's women's work. It's like, yes, it is. Get your boots out of my house. Yes, it is. There's quilla to be done. So it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool thing. And of course, we don't ever say, no, you can't quill if you're a man. Um, it's just usually the men that we did have one gentleman in our course that stepped out very early. And when we had a conversation with him, he said, it was really clear that this is a women's project because you, you ladies were talking about things that I shouldn't hear because they're women's things. And so he stepped out of the project to give us that respect in order to talk about things that, that women talk about. And they're very, very cognizant of that. Another gentleman, another tribal member I talked to recently, um, his wife had just finished this gorgeous basket. And I said, hey, I picked it up and I said, have you seen this? We said, look at what she did. And I was so excited for her. And he said, no. He said, I will not touch it until she tells me I can touch it. And he said, I have learned growing up that that is my place as a man, as a tribal man, that I wait because I can actually take her feminine energy out of it if I touch it before she tells me I can. So there are a lot of unspoken rules, um, societal rules and societal learnings that we have to relearn because of the disruption of the boarding schools too. Because I had actually never heard that and I was blown away and I said, that makes us so much more sense. And then I had to think back at all the times I had seen this gentleman and how he had never, ever, ever laid his hands on anything that any woman had ever created. Baskets, beadwork, quill work, none of it until he was invited. And that was just something I had missed throughout the years. So I was really glad that he pointed that out. That's the hardest thing to do uh, today, quite honestly, is wait for nature uh, because, I mean, our elders will tell us that, yeah, you wait until a certain time of year. Uh, because there are not a lot of people doing this now, though, we had the hardest time finding somebody who knew how to go harvest birch bark. We always found somebody, oh yeah, so-and-so knows somebody 
or so-and-so's cousin does it. Oh, great, where's so-and-so's cousin? Oh, he lives in Canada. It's pandemic, we can't bring him across the border. All right, so then we had to go to an alternate. And so what some of us actually ended up doing is we talked to a lot of the people in our community and we would get things like, wait for this time of year, wait for, wait until you see this type of insect, wait until you see, you know, the sap is flowing, wait until it's this degree of a temperature. So we took a lot of those things and then several of us actually went out on our own and we, we tried it. We, we put together what made the most sense out of all of that and we tried it. And that's where we get that, uh, that picture of the perfect peel. So that was um, amazing when it happened because when it doesn't happen, it's a mess. And the tree has to be straight. Thinking about talking about nature, you can't take a tree with a lot of knots in it, knots in the bark. There's going to be holes in your birch bark. So you're looking for the right tree. You might have 20,000 birch bark trees on your property, but you may only end up with five of them that are even usable for the project. And that's the other thing that you have to think about is how wide an expanse the uh, Mi'kmaq territory was. We ranged from the Canadian Maritimes all the way down towards Boston. And then we had historically um, designated and recorded trade routes that went as far as Manhattan. So in and along these traveled routes, you know, birch bark isn't very, very heavy. So if you find the right tree, then you might take a roll of birch bark with you or a couple of rolls and then end up trading that along the way. So it became a commodity in its original form as well as its finished quilled stage as well. Oh, they're fabulous quill workers. Yeah. And that's something tough to do too. And, and Julia will tell you that many times when you find a birch bark quilled box, like on eBay, or you go to an estate sale and you find something, uh, there's never any provenance with it. There's, there's never any paper trail to say, I bought this from so-and-so who got it from so-and-so who got it from so-and-so who bought it from a native uh, from the Passamaquoddy reservation or from the Mi'kmaq tribe. There's never that magical provenance. And that can be very frustrating. It's frustrating for us too, because our artists didn't usually sign them, although there are instances where the artist did sign it or the person who purchased the item wrote down, purchased at such and such a place for such and such a person, and then they'll put a date on it. Those are more the exception than they are the rule. So we have this unknown ancestor or the unknown ancestors, I should say, who have created this work and left it behind and made all these wonderful statements about life, about ideology that we just cannot ascribe it to. because I don't have enough patience some days for the quill work. <laughs> that, is, that is my dirty little secret. Uh, it takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of time. And sometimes I get very frustrated um, that my work, I also do bead work and I've done bead work since I was eight. Uh, sometimes I get frustrated that I'm not seeing enough of the pattern come out in a certain amount of time. So when I move to the glass medium, uh, it is my dream that folks will have windows in their houses someday of our ancient Mi'kmaq designs, even if they don't know it. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Thank you so much. And thank you for, to the Wilson Museum for having me. Um, I'm really excited that, that uh, so many of you showed up today. And I hope anybody in Zoom land had a good time too. Thank you. And just to wrap up, I want to uh, send out my thanks to Bangor Savings Bank, whose sponsorship is making our Makes Our Tech into Collection series possible. I want to encourage you to return for our, in July, check our calendar for when Jennifer will be here demonstrating. And also, 
take a trip down to Bar Harbor and go on one of Bar Harbor Ghost Tours, wonderful ghost tours of Bar Harbor. And you can not only learn about ghosts, but you learn about culture. And so it's a really wonderful learning opportunity. So check out Bar Harbor Ghost Tours in, in, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.